right so um before we start i'm going to take you on a very quick journey through time because um back before ai driven direct messages into your linkedin inbox back before direct mail back before cold calls back before even the written word whether you were building decision making software, you're a copywriter, or you were starting the next recruitment um, platform, if you wanted to spread the word about what you had, you only had one option to you. And that was word of mouth. And I'd argue not much has changed. We are tribal in our nature as human beings, that connection, that belonging piece drives through all of us. And what partnerships do is they take that relationship piece, that kind of, it's not who you know, it's what you know piece, and they take it to the next, they take it to the next level. Um, and if kind of that story based thing isn't enough for you, here's some stats company, companies with formalized referral marketing experience 86% more revenue growth. Um, and so what I want to do today is talk to you about partnerships and how that can really help accelerate your growth. Very quickly on for those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, who I am, what I do, why I do this stuff. Um, you'll notice a, a logo up in the top corner there called Business Scene. That was a membership organization that I ran. We grew that to a couple of thousand members, almost entirely through referrals or strategic partnerships. I was then responsible in a partnership capacity for providing leads to some of those big global brands you see there. And so I think I provided nearly, I've had reach of about a million small business owners. So we acted as the SME engagement point for some of these big brands. And I'll tell some stories about those as we go to try and make this real. And then at Collaboration Junkie now, for the last four years, I've helped nearly oh, well, over 100 business owners from founders and small business owners upwards to identify, nurture and scale referral and partnership opportunities through consultancy and workshops. And I'm delighted to see four, four, four clients on the call today. So that's uh, nice to see. Hi, Paul, Tom, Matt, and and, and Ollie, um, and Owen. Five. Oh, I'm doing all right. Um, okay. So um, before we crack on, I just want to do a quick thing around for me the difference between referrals and partnerships. Um, referrals all about your customers, your clients, your wider audience, your network. Um, I did a talk on that at the end of last year for Start to Stand Up. I'm sure the recording is kicking about somewhere. And if you'd like some more info on that, I've got another workshop coming up soon as well. So let me know. But what we're here to talk about today is partnerships. So partnerships are the strategic relationships. It's people who are talking to your ideal audience at the ideal time to buy on a consistent basis. And they have a vested interest in doing so. The work that I do is all about levering trust, leveraging trusted relationships. It's not so much about affiliate marketing. Um, I have no issue with affiliate marketing. It's a very valid route. It's where people have a list of people that they're happy to monetize. Um, absolutely brilliant channel for those of you that it works for, just not where my particular area of expertise lies. So we're gonna be talking about, um, we're gonna be talking about partnerships. And so what I wanna to cover today um, is Look, I have a framework for this stuff based on all that experience. So I'm going to stick to the framework, which is dance. Um, but specifically for founders and and, um, and when you're on this kind of journey of scaling, I'm going to look at um, how we partner up as I as I phrase it. So partnering with with bigger brands. Um, partnering for getting traction, partnering for launching your brand, partnering for scaling your brand and maybe how you can find the right partners to exit as well. Does that sound good, everyone? <laughs> yes, awesome. Right, I will leave plenty of time for Q&A, but if anyone's got any, I will pause at each point, and if anyone's got any particular questions, then please fire them in. Um, I'll also provide the slides back to Ollie, um, so if anyone wants a copy of those, they can have them. Okay, um, there is a golden rule on anything kind of partnership related and that is to make it easy quick show of hands who's busy at the moment who, who has whose days are typically busy days right yeah we live in a busy world right busy 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 which means if you want someone to do something for you which essentially any third party relationship is 
You need to make it easy for them to do for it to do it. The easier you make it for them to do the thing, the more likely they are to do it, the more likely they are to do it well, and the more likely they are to do it on time. Seems obvious. But just because it sounds obvious doesn't mean people actually do it. And so there's going to be an underlying theme here around how we make it easy for our partners to do what we want them to do. Um, OK, so they're called strategic partners because you need a strategy. So here's a quick outline of the dance framework that we're going to cover today. Number one is discovery. Who are our ideal partners? Who should we be working with? Then we move on to assembly, which is all the behind the scenes systems to make and the structure to make the stuff work. How do we nurture the relationships? So they become really rock solid and long lasting. How do we help our partners to connect us to their audience? The crucial bit where the magic happens. And how do we go out and engage and find more partners? So that's what we're going to cover today. OK, so let's start with um, let's start with discovery. And it's all about understanding who your ideal partner is. It doesn't mean we don't partner with other people, but much like having an ideal client, um, when you know who your ideal partners are, you're much more likely to attract those people. You can articulate it better to other people. So, you get more introductions. so it's a really crucial bit. Um, it's one step out of five in my framework, but whenever I work with clients, it's a third of the work that we do. And it's probably the piece that is never finished because you're constantly evolving and refining, particularly when you're in a kind of a, a growth stage of, of startups. Um, and the, and the place we start with this is around being specific. So first of all, you want to be really specific about what type of partners you have. Very often when I am, um, and this is very, very prevalent in agency space where I do a bit of work, quite a reasonable amount of work, people lump all their partners into one pot. But, um, that, and, and quite often they set up like cross referral relationships. That typically doesn't work because what I want you to do is think about the problem that you solve um, in the analogy of, a, of your customer and what they're trying to do. Very few of us solve a customer's problem from one end all the way to the other. I'm sure many of you have heard the analogy around people don't buy a drill, they're buying a hole in the wall. And they're not even buying the hole in the wall, they're buying the put up shelf. And I would argue they're probably buying the peace and quiet or the satisfaction of the person that wanted the shelf put up, having it put up. Your part, where you sit in a partner program is the same thing. If you think of the end to end customer journey, your ideal partners providing you leads are the people that sit just before you in the customer journey or overlap. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't work with people who come after you, but understand where they sit in your ecosystem. They may occasionally pass you leads, but you're much more likely to be providing work to them. And that's fine because they help you deliver a better product or service to your to your end user. So being really clear around who your different types of partners are immediately will help you gain some clarity in how you work with them. Um, it's then being really clear around what you're looking for from your partners. And this is where it depends on where you are in your journey as a as a founder. Um, if it's early days and maybe you're just looking for to to kind of prove user fit, you're in you're in Gideon space of kind of you're in that research stage. Maybe you just want partners who can get you loads of eyeballs on your product. And that's fine. That's a different type of partner. Maybe what you're going for, you're, you're, you're kind of looking for traction. And actually, the money's less important. You just need users on a platform. You need people that have tried your service. You need that, that next stage of thing. Again, there are certain partners who will deliver that. We'll come on to how we structure those partnerships in the next piece. Maybe it's more around you're actually launching the product now and what you're looking for is you're looking for proper qualified leads who will pay you the money that you're looking for. Again, it's a different type of partner. So being really, really clear around what stage you're at in your business and what you need most will allow you to, to identify the partners much, much clearer. Um, it also allows you to really understand who an ideal customer is which is absolutely key because um one of the things we need to look at depending on what you're looking for from your partner there's a simple three-stage process you need to do and that's write a big long list of everyone um 
who shares the same audience as you, right? So your target market, even down to the person within the business, the role in the business, if it's a B2B product or the consumer, what else are they buying? Where else are they hanging out? Who shares, it, who shares the same audience with you? That's the first criteria of a partner, right? The next thing to think about is the alignment. Right? Are they talking about similar things to what I do? I'm sure we've all had emails through from brand partnerships where it just seems really, really strange that those two people are partnering and it jars. It almost, it doesn't do anyone any favors. So is there alignment? Is that conversation going to be easy? Is that digital thing going to, going to sit right? Lego are the masters at this, by the way, the alignment piece, the way that they do their partner strategy. It's just absolute genius. Um, and then the final thing, and this really, again, comes down to that, what you're looking for from your partners in terms of quality of leads is what authority do they hold with the audience? Is them recommending you actually going to hold sway? Um, and that will depend on how qualified you need your leads. Once you've kind of done that, if you're looking for really who your ideal partners are, and if you take one thing away from today, I want it to, I want, I want it to be this, you need a really strong partner value proposition. Most people, when they're looking for partners, talk about all the great things that they can do for someone's clients. We should, we should definitely work together because I can do this, this and this for your clients. All that saying, even subconsciously, it's not how you mean it, is I want to sell to your list, which isn't a partner approach. So what your partner value proposition is, it's taking all that value you deliver to the client and going, why is that important to the partner? And this is where that value chain of the people that come before you works. It's about how am I helping the partner to deliver the end result that their, cult that their customer wants that they're ultimately being judged on. It's like a copywriter and a website builder, right? No one goes to a website builder for a well-coded website. They go because they want a website that does a job, right? That's what ultimately they're getting judged on. So the, that's the copywriter's value proposition for the website builder is they help them, they help them create websites for their clients that convert. Um, one of the, um, some of you on the call will know Kim from ISO Connect, brilliant platform for um, therapists doing their bookings. And um, we did some, we did some work and there, a lot of their partners are associations and they're not providing their members with a brilliant platform for doing all their booking. What they do, their value proposition for the associations is providing real life, tangible value for someone's membership. They're providing practical support and advice around a really sticky privacy issue around people using Zoom. And it's all about the added extras for the association not the actual product they're delivering so i want to be i would urge you to be really clear about the value that the, why your partners care about what you do because if you can't think of a reason why they care they're not ideal partners they may be affiliates but they're not ideal partners and taking this a step further and this is the partnering up piece have a think about what your impact is and it can be really we can all kind of get in our own ways around wondering why people would want to partner with us. Um, but there are very good reasons why a bigger brand would want to par partner with you. Either you're innovative and you're doing something they can't do and they want to get to market. If you have any kind of social angle, environmental angle, anything like that, that can be a reason why people want to do it. I, I was on a sustainability podcast the other week and this was a key thing around how brands in this space can really partner up because typically as founders we are agile we are able to do things quickly that other brands just can't do and understanding what our worth is can be a really really powerful thing i'll give a very quick story on this um and that's um we used to do some work with a big global um digital marketing agency, uh, digital, digital marketing provider, um, Yell, used to be Yellow Pages. And um, this was one around my benefit business. And my main contact was leaving. And I was a bit worried because the person that was going to come back in and do it, I didn't have as close a relationship with, was, it was a nice relationship. It was worth well into five figures a month for us. And I was really worried this relationship was going to go. The handover meeting went really well. I hung around afterwards to chat to my old contact and say goodbye. 
I kind of said to him my concerns and he turned around to me and said I don't think you understand how crucial a role you play in our UK engagement strategy Dave and I had no idea bearing in mind their their director of that department probably made more money than our business did um it, I just had no idea that we made that much of an impact and I would say if you find the right partners where there's something that you can do either your audience or your reach or your outlook or the impact you can make then you are absolutely available to go and get bigger partners than you would ever possibly um, imagine. But understanding your value to a partner and phrasing it that way and putting all your language that way, if there's one thing you take from today, I want it to be that. Are we all okay on that? I will move on if so, if there's no questions. Awesome. Um, right, assembly next. Um, all the systems that sit behind the scenes. Um, there's a reason why I use this image, other than loving festivals and music. Um, imagine whatever your musical tastes are, a new festival comes out and the lineup is out of this world. All killer, no filler, bands have reformed. It's just the most amazing thing ever. So excited about it. You get there on the day though, and it takes you two hours to get in because the ticketing is a shambles. When you get in, um, there's only one bar and the queues are massive and the beer's rubbish. And the food outlets are all over the place. The toilets are rubbish. Then the band start. The sound system's crap, and this and the and the lineup is all out of wax. You don't know who's on when. No matter how good the lineup for next year's festival is, you're probably not going back because you don't trust that behind the scenes they're going to deliver the right experience. And so having the right systems in your behind in your business to deliver a consistent level of service to your partnerships doesn't win new partners but it sure as hell keeps you them. So it's really important to get this stuff right. And because it builds trust, but it also sets you up to scale. And it's much easier to do this stuff from the outset than it is kind of try and retrofit it. So number one thing that you need to look out for is tracking. If you have partners that are providing you data, know where that data is, whether it's prospects or customers. Every time someone passes you a contact, whether it's in person or digital, they are not just giving you an introduction, they are giving you a little bit of their reputation to look after. So treat that with the trust and respect it deserves. Um, because if you can't tell someone where people are on your journey, one of, and I've had this, one of people will think one of two things, either you're not tracking it and you're trying to dodge any commission payments or anything like that, which means you're a crook, or you genuinely don't know, which means you're incompetent. And crook and incompetent are two looks that we don't want as business owners and particularly not as partners. So really important that you track your data in. You can get fancy partnership management software for thousands of pounds a month. You can get basic CRM systems. You can use a spreadsheet if you really want. It's better to use a spreadsheet that you use than a CRM system that you don't. Um, I recommend CRMs because it allows for the scale. The other thing is around lead handling. Now, you can enter into a new partnership and they're gonna put out a mailing to everywhere. And you're like, awesome, that's my first 1,000 users on my new platform, brilliant. Probably not gonna happen, guys. But plan for it happening. Plan for it happening. Expect the worst, plan for the best, because another surefire way to lose trust and potentially lose potentially great long-term partners is to not handle inbound leads in the right efficient manager uh, man, um, manner. And going back again to one of the, those big brands you saw on that uh, the slide of people I'd worked with before, we ran a campaign for some free sales data to members and non-members. Well, this is going to be amazing. We're going to get loads of happy members and new potential prospects in because of this offer. We told the big brand this is going to go well. We set it up to make it really easy for clients. They had to just click one button and then the data would go straight to the partner. All GDPR compliant, don't worry, uh, to contact them. We promised a two-day turnaround. We sent the campaign. We delivered really good results. We delivered a thousand leads over a two-day period, and so it took the partner two weeks to get back to people. So instead of happy members and lots of new inquiries, we had pissed-off people wanting their sales data, and that partnership never recovered. So make sure you track data and make sure you can handle the requests in an efficient manager. And as I said, it's much easier to do this stuff from the start. And if you're building a SaaS platform, then really look at how you can integrate that. Um, 
the other thing I want to cover under assembly is the structure of your partnerships. And this is where it's really important to think again about where you are in your journey and what you're looking for from your partnerships. Um, I always recommend with referrals, incentivizing up front is a really gray area and I don't recommend doing it. Referrals will happen because people want to refer you. With partners, I recommend a commercial relationship. I think it helps elevate the partnership. Um, whether that's, um, I'm a big fan of lifetime value. So for me, I always do a percentage of lifetime value. That rate can drop. There's, there's a whole, you could do a whole talk on pricing strategies for partnerships. So anyone wants more info on that, I can send it to them. Um, but I do recommend it. Some sectors won't allow you to do it or they can't accept payments. Bung it in a charity pot, do something for it. Find a cause that relates to your brand. Do something that helps formalize it. The piece I want to cover today that I think can be relevant for founders is the structure in terms of what you're willing to give. So a lot of the partnerships I worked, um, I worked and developed, I received a commission, but there was also an offer to the member because uh, um, it was a membership organization we were running. And it's important to think about what's most important to you at any one given point. So if you're looking for traction, let's say, and you just need users, then or it's that um, then then think about how how heavy a discount you can offer, right? What's more valuable to you? Twenty people at a full price or a thousand people at a absolute ridiculously stupid fraction of the cost. That will not be that that will change for any given founder and their and, and their own platform, right? It depends on what you need when as to what you want to offer. We got a thousand members who were working with someone who we gave fifty percent discount to to our membership and they pre-bought them as part of the package and gave them away. And for us, like that was a we'd have gone much lower, to be honest with you, um, because we got a thousand members all in one hit. And we so we we halved our product cost. We figured out our margins, we knew what we could do. So have a think about where you want to go. If it's launch, well, what can you do? What sort of things can you do to entice those early adopters in? Those people that will shout about what you do. Is there a discounted lifetime value thing on your on, on on your kit is there a is there a, a better rate is there an enhanced service what can you do at that point to really attract those early adopters in make them feel special because they're the people that will shout about you and get that kind of bell curve going um and then when we're into kind of scale we're scaling our, our brands up it's then it's then what's my long-term partnership model what is that percentage revenue piece that fits in as a cost of sales so really important to think about not every partnership will fit everyone and just thinking about where you are in your journey and what I need right now. And it's not a one size, it's not a one size fits all. We're all okay on that kind of structure piece. Yeah. Cool. Right. Nurturing. Um, all about developing the relationships. Um, it's what makes working partnership enjoyable. Um, it's what, but it's also what makes sure you make the most of the opportunity and uncover the most opportunities. Um, there can be a real, particularly in the SaaS space, there can be a real tendency for partnerships to be a little bit over automated. Um, and maybe if you are in the affiliate space, that's absolutely fine. There is a time and a place for AI and automation, even within partnerships. But there is also a crucial time for making sure that you remember you're connecting with real humans at the core of this partnership, right? Um, if you had your key investor on the hook, you wouldn't leave it to AI and automation to converse with them, would you? And that's how you need to think about your key partners. They are crucial stakeholders in your business because they hold the key to your success and your scale. So, um, yes, for uh, transactional things automate but but don't forget there's a real relationship um of the three there's all sorts of things that you should be doing as part of a partner program and nurturing relationship from first meeting through onboarding to ongoing but i'm going to mention three that are crucial that i see people not do number one set expectations right and document them if it's a formal partnership agreement then then fine but at the very least a one pager or an email this is what this is why we're working together. This is what we're looking to do. And this is 
what who's going to do what and when so you want to do the long-term goal and you want to do the short-term piece as well around what's the easy thing we can do to get going and who's going to get going and who's going to do it and who's going to do it when really really recommend you do it, it can be really counterintuitive because we're all excited about this new partnership that's going to help us take our business to the next level but actually stopping and going let's get some commitments in here let's make sure we're on the same page is really important because if you're just five percent out in your thinking with your partner at that first meeting over time that gap gets bigger and bigger and some becomes disparate so i honestly can't stress about setting expectations um, enough next keep your partners informed so this links in with the tracking bit be proactive in it give them updates let them know what's going on with their little bit of reputation this is the stuff that can be semi-automated or at the very least templated but another bit that can't is strategic review so on the flip side of our partners have self-service they can do what they want is that oh we um, we talk to our partners all the time daily right if you're talking to your partners daily it's probably because it's busy and it's about transactional stuff what's going on take the time to have strategic reviews of your partners stuff that's outside of the day-to-day -day. ideally do it in person over lunch right form the personal relationship get people relaxed because as well as reviewing the successes of the partnership you can ask them about niggle what could be done better and there's because there's stuff that they wouldn't necessarily tell you day to day but in a more relaxed environment when you've mentioned to them that it's about you're looking to improve they'll, they'll loosen up and they'll tell you those stuff which you want but the crucial thing about these strategic reviews as well is about being curious being genuinely curious about what's going on in their world because unfortunately fellow founders we are not the center of our partner's universe as much as we would love <laughs> i know andrew right shocker as much as we would love them to be no matter how much our clients our partners anyone around us no one loves no one loves your business as much as you do right i'm really even ollie with his unbelievable infectious enthusiasm for all things startup he still doesn't love your business as much as you do right so by being curious and finding out what's going on in their world you'll uncover stuff they'll go oh oh no oh, we're doing this thing over here oh oh and either you'll go oh do you know we could do that even though they do know it because you've told them before but they've forgotten or you'll uncover an opportunity for someone else oh why know someone that can help with that so being genuinely curious be interested before trying to be interesting all that stuff but being genuinely cool as well as just being a fun state to be in will uncover more opportunities for you and that's the power of strategic reviews um right connection this is what ties it all together it's where so many um so many businesses so many partnerships just fizzle out and it's because the person signs or there's a handshake or an exchange of emails and then it just waits you wait for the magic to happen and the magic doesn't happen typically you need to make it happen you need to support your partners help them to connect their audience to you do the hand holding make it easy so there's two strands to this first one is partner facing if your partners have a um personal relationship with their clients then make sure they understand how to position you when to position you what to listen out for and if you're working and and remember that if they've got a team of people that are doing this don't just rely on the super super kind of entrepreneurial opportunistic head of the business that you're dealing with support their team members as well make sure everyone that's on that's going to be responsible for activating the partnership understands the value proposition and understands how to relay that to the audience some of this stuff may seem obvious to you but it's not common sense it's experience but what neil does he finds easy to do because he's been doing it for years but other people it'll be like right that's true of all of us we all have our own unique experience that makes us that means we can shortcut steps sometimes don't do that with your partners Give them the benefit of what's in your head really nice way of phrasing it if you don't want to teach people how to suck eggs by the way is we've done this some stuff for other partners before we thought we might you might find it you might find it useful it's not going hey you need this it's just going 
here's this thing of support if you want it. Um, so there's there's nice ways of phrasing it. And if you really want to take it to the next level, um, and this can be can work particularly well with, with software is how can you build yourself into your partner's processes? Right? If your value proposition, it's why it's so important to get your partner value proposition right. If your value proposition is right, your partner wants you in front of as much of their audience as they possibly can. So how can you build yourself into their processes so that they don't even have to think about it? it it's all automated. It's things like using Ollie as an example with his R&D business and um, partnered with accountants. Um, so as part of accountants onboarding process, they can they can put a few questions in about R&D tax credits and what's there. Very simple things, right? Really obvious, easy things, but it generates an opportunity for the partner to refer in. If it's a software product, is it a tick box on some kind of user journey? Think about your partner's user journey. Make it easy for them. They will thank you for it, I promise you. And you'll and you'll like it because you'll get more leads. The other side of it is customer facing. Look, you could I could double that word soup, right? All the stuff that you would do for your own marketing. Think about how you can provide that to your partners so they're not just putting you in front of old uh, of, of new clients that come on board, they can go out to their old list. Like whatever it is you can, whatever it is you're doing now, convert that over. But ask them, what activities are you doing that are working well? If they're doing webinars and they're working really well and they work really well, they get great conversions, then whether you like it or not, you need to do a webinar, right? If they run live events, then I know speaking. I know speaking in front of audience isn't everyone's cup of tea, but put your big girl pants on and do it if that's what they're going to get really good traction. So have stuff that you can provide them, but also ask them what what works well. And there's all sorts of things you can do: live Q and A's, all this kind of stuff. But one thing to remember back on the make it easy front is don't just send them your standard materials. Amend it so that, that it sounds like it's coming from them. So they can literally copy and paste. Um, we worked with, uh, in fact, it was Yale. When we worked with Yale, we were sending one or two emails a week out from them to other people's audiences. We were the middle people. But every email we got from them, despite them having a ridiculously huge marketing department, was written as though they were sending it to their own audience. So uh, we had to amend it and then send it back to them for approval before it could send out again. Now we stuck with them as a partner because it was a big partner. We took the hit, but if it had been a smaller partner, we'd have looked to go elsewhere because it was hassle. We just wouldn't have sent the emails. So make it as easy as possible for your partner to send out what you want them to send. Um, because doing that, um, oh, what's happened there? I should say become the marketing manager's best friend rather than the main manager's best friend. But there we go. Not sure what's happened there. Um, we can think it's a bit cheeky asking to send loads of content out. But if your partner's marketing manager, and by the way, a marketing person can be the same person as the business owner. It's just depending on the size of the partner, right? But whoever they are, there's a good chance they're stressed and overworked. And so you sending them high value content, which if your partner value proposition is right, the content will be valuable. They will want to put it in front of their audience. It's another blog post they don't have to write. It's another video they don't have to record. It's a social post they don't have to draft. It is a speaker they don't have to find. Become the marketing manager's best friend at your partners because then also you'll get more opportunities when they run that event and they're thinking of a speaker or whatever. They'll go, oh, oh, Louisa, could you come and do this thing for us? And Louisa will go, oh, yeah, thanks, of course. So become the market manager's best friend. It's in everyone's interest. It's true partnership. Finally, engagement. How do we go out there and get more partners? Um, so, first of all, it's not as hard as you would think, I would suggest. It's not, I'm pretending it's easy, but it's not hard. The first thing is remember your partner value proposition. If you're making cold outreaches, that value proposition piece will stand you apart from other people in your space looking to do the same thing because you're talking in their language. However, inboxes, DMs, they're overflowing, right? It's one of the reasons why partner channels are so strong because you're piggybacking someone else's reputation and relationship rather than going in cold. So um, 
use your network for partners. Look for introductions. Because if you combine someone else's relationship with a really strong partner value proposition, the referral becomes really easy. Now, referrals should be easy anyway, um, but but they're not always because if you're if you're looking for introductions to direct clients, the person making the introduction, no matter how nice and soft your sales process is, the person making the introduction still knows that there is a there is a potential kind of sales thing here, and that can put some people off. When you're looking for introductions to partners, there is no sell. Right. If you've got your partner value proposition, right, you're looking into an introduction to someone for a genuine mutual opportunity. And so looking for looking for introductions to partners through referrals is a really, really strong way of doing it. On that sale piece, by the way, when you're having partner conversations, yes, you may need to lead the conversation. But if it ever feels like a pitch. Stop because you're pitching. You shouldn't have to pitch a partnership. It should feel like an opportunity. As I said, lead the conversation, but the other person should be getting excited as well. Um, it's not a sales thing. It's a genuine opportunity piece. Um, and it, so you've either got your value proposition wrong or the other person just doesn't get it, which does does happen, right? Um, so, so in terms of that, like being really clear on what introductions you're looking for and then trying to leverage your network is a great way to grow. Once you've got more partners on board, then um, the social proof from those partners means that you can go colder and colder and colder. But for most of us, we have good introductions within our network if we just look to leverage them. And the final thing I want to I want to mention around this, around who ideal partners are, is is look is when we're looking at choosing partners, is some extra criteria around, and um, if we're in a position to be slightly pickier, what we want from them. So. Partners that enable that and might shout about you and the partnership are great because that helps for your brand. Um, partners that are, that are larger and allow some credibility by association are great. You can bring partners on board, um, that then other partners will just domino in because they're like, well, if they're working with them, then then we want to. Um, but also, you can be strategic about thinking about where your exits lie. Now, unfortunately never quite worked out with my uh, with my benefit org but there are a couple of partners that we brought on board specifically because um while they didn't have the greatest reputation we um inherently we knew what they were trying to do and we were confident in the value they were delivering um and so we accepted them as partners um previous mistakes doesn't mean if we if we were confident enough in the culture of them that were changing and it was a previous reputational piece then we were we were kind of fine with that but we had one eye on the fact that those businesses need to do something different in a space and our broader proposition was something that could that could, could come off now unfortunately my business partner at the time was had worse shiny had the worst shiny object syndrome of anyone i've ever met in my life and i'm pretty bad so a couple of those didn't come off for that reason one that really could have covid kind of put paid to and put paid to the business in the end um, but we were very intentional about going, yes, this partner is right for right now because they're delivering the thing to help scale us. But actually, in a couple of instances, we were, we had a couple of partners we could have gone with and we looked at one where actually there could be a potential exit strategy in there. So it's just that thing around where that partner value proposition is so tight. It's so integrated. It's going, yeah, okay. Are these people that if we position it right and have the right conversations could just look look to um to buy us out and interestingly if you do that setting expectation piece around long term ex and look at long term you might find that it comes up there or you can certainly kind of test the water and, and and seed it in that setting expectations piece so have a really strong partner value proposition but make sure that's relevant for where you are in your journey and what you need right now is it eyeballs? Is it traction and users? Is it paid customers? What is it? Is it exit? Have the systems in place and set your partnership structure up to deliver the result that you need. Make sure that you use AI and use automation to save time where you can, but make sure that you keep that core of a human relationship front and center because it's where the magic happens. Make it easy for your partners to do what you want them to do, which is put you in front of their audience. 
send your people over and yeah remember your partner value proposition leverage leverage your network and understand the unique thing that you do that your partners will look for put those together and you'll be rocking and rolling um so that's me um look if anyone wants more support on this stuff give me a shout um i do one-to-one -one work um i run group programs um so there's a lot there's a yeah there's a lot more than a half hour whiz through but um thank you for listening any questions i am more than willing to take them dave that was awesome any questions for dave this morning on a, a very important uh topic this one is not sharing have you got any questions there um Oh, all good. I've stung them into silence. You have, I think, Dave. We're, I've learned every time you talk about partnerships, and it's an important area for a lot of startups, stand up uh, members in their businesses. Always pick up bits, Dave. It's it's fantastic. So there's a lot of value in there. Um, any any questions? I got one on webinars. Yeah. You, you touched on it, Dave. Um, thoughts on Evergreen? <clears throat> um, I think that is one that depends on the audience and your own and your own solution, right? So, if it's if it's something that is easily explained, right? It's a clear product. Um, then there's no there's no harm in doing that right also if your partner has an audience that's a large audience and is coming back time and time again then it's a really efficient way it's a really efficient way of doing it um so i think there's a not a one size fits all and there's a time and a place for like that explain and this is what we do this is how you use it um and there's different things there's the sales evergreen webinar and then there's the if you have integrated your solution into your partners, and so there's almost this more people are joining than not, then there's the user, there's the onboarding. This is how to make the most of what we do piece as well. So, um, which are perfect for Evergreen, right? They don't need live. Yeah. Time. Um, no, that case study and then call to action piece is actually quite a powerful top of funnel. Yeah, absolutely. And, but then I think for where you have got a, a, um, a solution that lends itself to an Evergreen type thing, what you then do is you can do ask me anything live q a type thing yeah more client. authentic yeah yeah which are which are people coming with real life stuff so that, that would be that would be my but it's it's about what your partner wants right if yeah. your partners go oh we only ever get yeah live didn't really work for us but actually we do these recorded ones and they get a thousand views on our youtube channel well then listen to your partner you go where well, you go what works right so you got some of these tools that let you do pseudo live like as in the chat's still functioning but the rest of it's recorded um yeah right but yeah. There's, there's, there's a quite a famous example of a well-known public speaker who did who got found out for doing that but to try oh. and make it more live they would always uh, the doorbell would go and they'd have to go and get a parcel but then like it got found out because someone went on more than one webinar and lo and behold oh. same thing happened and it's like so uh look authenticity get i Look, if people want to do that, go for it, but run it live or don't, don't run it recorded. Like, yeah, and yeah. If, be, up, be up front about it. Here's some questions that we often get asked. Bam, 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 bam. Right. You don't need to, in this day and age, I don't think you need to lie about it. Um, no, here, here. Cool. Thanks, Thanks, Gareth. Um, Dave, there's a point um, from Paul in the chat, Paul Banks, and then we'll go to Neil. So Paul's put lots of people say that referrals and partnerships will eventually dry up and won't be a viable long-term channel or one that can even drive the majority of business for a company. Thoughts? Thoughts. Thank you for that question, Paul. That's a brilliant one. Your check is in the post. Um, if you want to use partnerships and referrals to scale, particularly referrals, people see it as a starting out thing. If you want more, if you want to use referrals to sell from your clients, then you need to build a culture of referrals in your brand. You need to make sure everyone that's customer facing feels empowered and has the skills and the knowledge to be able to make to ask for introductions and spot the signs for it, so that it's not relying on a couple of key founders, right? Um, because that's typically what happens in agency model and professional services is 
all the referrals are relied on a couple of key people at the top of the business. They get very twitchy about that because you can't scale because it's all relying on them and the clients that they bring in because they've been bringing in by referral want more of their time. So you need to build cultures of referrals in your brand. On a partnership side, um, yeah, no, I think partnerships, not for every, I know plenty of brands that scale pure, almost purely through partnership. I think the difference is, is as you scale, I'm not some, I wouldn't ever say you don't need to do the other stuff. Brand, for example, becomes more and more important, the larger and larger partners you look, you look for. Um, so all that other marketing stuff, um, particularly in the B2B space, is still vitally important because you still need it to support your partners. Um, but the the bigger the partners you're looking for, the more you need it for your own, for the credibility as well. Even if you get referred into someone, they're still going to want to go and go and check you out. So I think it's a case of it absolutely for, for, for businesses can deliver the scale they need. You just still need to do, make sure you've got your house in order with all the other stuff at the same time. It, it touches on everything else. Thanks, Paul. Um, Neil. Oh uh, yeah, brilliant talk, Dave. Thank you. Um, my my questions um, on, I guess, financial relationships. Um, just to, I had somebody kind of invite me into a pitch. Said, "Oh, what I was doing, fantastic!" And I really added value to their service offering. As soon as we got anywhere near kind of talking about going in for a pitch, they jumped down my throat with a twenty percent referral commission and got me to wanted me to sign a document i kind of laughed and went that's not quite normal in my industry because i think it might have been a separate industry thing and and basically said you know well i'm happy to subcontract and you can mark it up as much as you like <laughs> but i i wasn't going to be responsible for or i didn't want to sign a contract on that and i was just you know i just kind of like was shocked by that but i don't know what what is what is normal <coughs> partnerships is it kind of you work side by side and it's mutually beneficial or is it something that there's a an accepted initial referral thing or is it just always commission on whatever's sold i mean what what is so there isn't there isn't a one size fits all mm -hmm. business, right? um and where it's introduced a referral i think it's more about the shared value as i said i think with partnerships where you're looking to really embed it the commercial aspect i actually encourage because it protects the relationship, it elevates it, it just adds more structure. And essentially it's a cost of sale, right? If they're providing you leads, it's a cost of sale. Now, um, and so I don't necessarily have an issue with with that, but, but what I would expect, if it, let's say it's 20%, is to understand more around what they're doing for that 20%, what the relationship's gonna look like, how are they referring you, how are they referring you in? And what you don't want, I say you don't want if they literally just if they're only doing it for the money you kind of got a bit more of an affiliate relationship right so for me the partner value proposition is still always the key thing that there's this shared end goal you share the value same values with the partner all that stuff aligns the 20 percent or the 10 percent or whatever it is just helps solidify this thing keeps everyone's skin in the game and allows you to do all that other stuff around what let's build let's build a, a, me into your processes all that sort of stuff that opens the door to that so um i'm not averse to it in you know but there's got it's got to be in a true partnership for me for it for that place to be in terms of percentages i've had 50 percent commission of software products before because they were mature software products they made their money back so they were pure profit i've known people that have done 80 percent commission before because they were well funded and just wanted traction. They wanted like, and so they were like, that was all that was important because the, the, the actually the 80% commission was fine because what they really needed was a number of paying users to get the next obscenely crazy round of investment that they were promised if they got this thing, right? Um, the only number, the number one rule is it's got to feel fair and equitable to both parties because otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, if it's if you're begrudging doing the work because you're not making enough margin, that doesn't work. But if it's so low that they don't, that the person feels even insulted to a point, but it's, it's not worth it, then that doesn't work either. So that's the only, it has to feel fair and equitable. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, if everything else about the relationship felt right, I wouldn't shy away from it, Neil. I'd, I'd just look to kind of understand how this is going to work. 
because if it's just the same as a friendly casual one but they're taking 20 percent, well then that's not it okay thank you